Hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome out to tonight's training webinar. I just want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. We always, uh, I think we always enjoy holding these webinars every week, and uh, and I think I appreciate the fact that everybody takes the time to actually get on and join us and uh, and join the conversation. So uh, this is our weekly training webinar. I'm Shade Frey. I'm with Steven Swenson here. Um, and we are going to talk about some different aspects of uh, things related to tax liens and tax deeds. Yeah, definitely. You know, as you mentioned about these weekly webinars, I think I, agree, I completely agree with you. I mean, as far as, you know, us, us getting a chance to touch base with you guys on a weekly basis, uh, it helps us to get an idea of, of where our members are at collectively and kind of as a group and uh, some of the things that you guys are interested in or topics that you'd want to talk about or questions that you might have, uh, we're able to address them on a weekly basis. Yeah. Now, uh, just a couple of things. First, uh, just to cover some news and some announcements here. That We just got back from doing the, uh, the three-day event. In fact, we, uh, we left uh, last week on, on Thursday, and uh, we got back. Uh, Monday night, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, it was a great event. It, it was. It was a fantastic event. In fact, uh, I just want to thank the uh, some of the people that are here with us tonight that uh, that attended the event. I can see a couple of the attendees there, and see Randy and Arthur there. Just wanted to thank you guys for attending the event and for making it as wonderful as it was. It was a really great um, experience, a great vibe the entire time in the event, and uh, really, we just thoroughly enjoyed it and uh, we felt like we made a lot of new friends there so we uh, we really enjoyed that we're going to get some more information out because uh, we enjoy doing these and there's a high enough demand that we're going to start doing more um, but first just an observation that I thought was interesting uh, that one of the attendees at the event made and that was this um, one of the attendees of the event uh, explained that they were more of a visual learner and I think I understand what he meant when he said that. Um, you know, I think you could also say maybe some people are, are to a degree, experience-based learners. In other words, some people can open up a book and they can read the book and they process that information that way. And that's how they retain things. And those typically tend to be the people that do great in school because that's how their mind works. But there are others that need, um, they need almost more um, interaction. You know, they need uh, something that is a little bit more visual that they can uh, interact and experience with. And I think that that's something that the, the events offer that's hard to pinpoint or um, I think see the benefit of before you actually go. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And, and really, I think that, that all of the attendees uh, that attended this, this event really, to some degree, were the same way especially when it comes to the, you know, as far as researching properties and going, really going through each of those methods, I think every one of us uh, tend to learn, or at least a lot of us, you know, through, through some type of experience training. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing to watch us go through something or, you know, to follow along in a video or even to participate in a webinar, but it's something else to sit next to somebody and to have them explain something to you. And I think that makes a big difference for a lot of people because um, I certainly sense that there were a lot of things that we talked about that, uh, that I'm sure the attendees that were there probably thought they kind of already understood, but then suddenly we explained something in a certain way and it changed how they viewed different things. And, and uh, you could tell there were certain things that just kind of clicked with them. And suddenly, as a whole, it started to make more sense to them. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the advantages of being there over three days is we're going through each one of these topics and we're explaining them. Uh, in that small little group, you know, anyone can stop and say, hey, uh, back up a minute or explain this a different way or, or, or let, let me see if I understand this. That way, you know, throughout those three days, somebody has really all of those questions and even questions that they didn't know that they had end up getting answered. Uh, just through that, you know, that one-on-one -on -one interaction, small group interaction. Yeah, yeah. In fact, we love doing them. In fact, we uh, we enjoy doing them enough, and there's enough demand that we're actually already looking at scheduling the next one, which we already know where we're going to hold it. The next one we're going to hold here in Utah, 
and that will either be uh, will either base that in Park City or out of Salt Lake. Uh, we haven't decided here just yet, and we're not positive on a date yet. Yeah, I put down here December, possibly January, because we're just not sure. It's uh, basically to be announced. So we will let you know as soon as we get that uh, those dates announced, so that any of you that want to attend can uh, can get enrolled uh, while there are openings. Um, oh, other than that, we also have uh, new secondary properties that are uh, that are available, and specifically, there are some great properties here. Um, although uh, the uh, the the event attendees are looking through some of the properties first, but we wanted to share with you just quickly here what we actually um, got. These are properties that uh, that uh, we just got in actually after we got back from uh, from the event and. Uh, they're fantastic properties, so I just wanted to uh, to talk about those for just a second here to show you a couple of the uh, the new secondary tax deeds that we have because we don't always have single family homes um, in the secondary properties, but we do right now. We've got several single family um, homes that are in the list, and I just want to give you an idea here of what the properties might sell for, basically how the, the, uh, the secondary properties work here. So again, these are properties that uh, I'm sure a lot of these will probably end up getting purchased by the, the event attendees, but we wanted to show them to you anyway so that you can get an idea of how the secondary program is intended to work. So you see this house up here on the, uh, the first one, member cost on it is $6,141. The assessed on it's about 19,000. Market value on it's probably somewhere between 38 and 45 from what we can tell with a rent estimate of about $600 a month. So again, we're talking about a, uh, a cheap house. It might need uh, some fix up, some repairs, but uh, it's probably not going to be a huge amount, but for $6,000 starting out there into a property that could be rentable, uh, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, even if you were to put in two or 3,000 a new carpet and, and paid to get the property rentable, you know, even at, even at that cost, you're looking at a property that can start generating residual income immediately, or you could turn around and flip it for whole, for wholesale, or you could uh, go through the quiet title process and sell out of the market for full value. Yeah, in fact, uh, just think about this for a minute, okay? We're talking about properties that you can pick up for six, seven thousand dollars, basically, that have the capacity to be income properties, okay? And at 600 bucks a month even, you can say. When we're looking at that on a yearly basis, um, you know, it, it's not just 600 bucks a month, we're talking about $7,000 in a year. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I mean, and, and that is in the first year. So in other words, a property like this as a rental would pay itself off within the first year, okay? And that's, not even adding the fact that you still own the property after that first year, you know, but it has that ability to bring in that much revenue. And I can tell you right now that if banks could figure out a way to invest, uh, you know, seven, ten thousand dollars into something that would generate seven thousand dollars a month, you know, I mean, a year annually from there on out, that's all they would invest in because, you know, the numbers on that just make perfect sense. Uh, the one down here below, uh, member cost 6,800, assessed value 23,000. Uh, Zillow value, again, same 35 to $45,000 range, rent right estimate of 650 a month. Okay, so again, we're talking about properties that have the, the ability to generate $7,000 a year roughly in, uh, in revenue, which is amazing. I mean, it's not yearly revenue either, it's monthly revenue, it's residual revenue, it's money that comes in like a paycheck. Yeah, and you could use several different strategies. You could rent these properties out. You could do a lease option. You could do seller financing. The advantage is when you are purchasing a property or home free and clear, you own that home essentially free and clear. So you're not worrying about a mortgage. You're not worrying about some of the other things that may that may come with that. And so it, it's worth it to spend fifty hundred dollars a month, possibly to have a a, somebody completely handle the property for you unless you're doing seller financing or something like that and then the property owner is going to I mean the person that's buying the property is going to take uh, some of that responsibility and so you know the ability to earn that type of cash flow or worst case scenario if you're even paying a property management company your cash flow on 600 you know uh, 
five hundred fifty to six hundred fifty dollars a month, you know that you, you're looking at a, a pretty good cash flow property that can sit, that can pay itself off within a year, and then after that time, you're just really looking at straight profit of six hundred, seven hundred dollars a month coming in every single month. You know, I think that's a good point. I don't know how many times I've heard people um, talk about rentals in a really negative light as far as just being like, oh, I do not want a rental. Um, but keep something in mind. When we talk about rentals, um, pretty much everything that somebody thinks of when it comes to a rental is in a completely different situation than what you have with tax sale properties that you're buying outright. Uh, when most people consider rentals, they're thinking about trying to, to match the payment that they owe every month and keep the place occupied, you know, to essentially try to cover the, the mortgage, which can be a great way to, to, uh, to basically buy a property if you want over the long term, but uh, it's a stressful way to own property because you have to keep the property occupied, otherwise you have to worry about, you know, about uh, needing to pay this, this giant uh, base mortgage on it every single month. Well. When you're dealing with properties like this, that's just not one of your concerns. Paying 10% to a property management company it makes perfect sense if with a property like this because uh, you have the profitability to work with on it. So, um, you know, here's a couple others here. Member cost on the one on the top here is 5541. Uh, assessed value on it's about 19,000. Zillow value 3545. Rent estimate about 700 a month. And uh, the one down below that member cost of 8541. Uh, with an assessed value of thirty-six thousand, market value thirty-eight to forty-five, a rent estimate about seven fifty a month. Um, so, uh, all of these are just some quick examples of the properties here. Um, these are ones that uh, we'll see. Basically, once the members, uh, the uh, the attendees that from the event look over those uh, over the next week or so, then these will be available uh, to some of the other people with the secondary program. So, uh, keep that in mind and let us know. Um, as far as what we're going to be talking about tonight, exit strategies. Real estate exit strategies are what we'll be focused on tonight. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of things. We're going to talk about uh, terminology. We're going to talk about time frames. Talk about selecting your exit strategy. Um, we're going to talk about different strategies for selling property. Um, and also things like holding strategies, income properties. There's a ton of stuff that, uh, that we can cover, so we'll try to fly through this pretty quick. If you have any questions, though, pause or stop us at any point, and, uh, and we're happy to, uh, to stop and answer questions here. I think that always makes for the best trainings. Okay, so first, when we're talking about an exit strategy, just remember always that your exit strategy is basically how you turn these investments into capital. It's an incredibly important step. It's where the rubber meets the road, and so it's not one that we can overlook. You know, in fact, your exit strategy to monetize a property is just as important as how you acquired it or how much you paid. You know, in other words, you could get those things perfectly right. You know, as far as buying the property right, you're really cheap, and you could still screw up on the exit strategy and not make money. That, that's how important the exit strategy is, so it can't be overlooked. Uh, you need to put as much thought into it as you do into uh, the cost of the property and your, du your due diligence prior to buying it. Yeah, and even when you purchase a property or start to begin to purchase a property or think about it, you know, it's good to have an idea of what that exit strategy and really an idea of what you're going to do with the property oh, there's Steve, too. He's too. Sorry. Uh, before you even invest into it. So. As you're, as, you're, as you're looking at a property, you're, you're already putting into plan how you're going to sell it. Now, it may be a combination of two things, so maybe you're wholesaling and possibly seller financing, so you can do more than one exit strategy, but you need to have an idea of exactly how you're going to do it and what you want to do once you purchase that property. Yeah. Now, uh, there are a number of different acronyms and terms that we're going to to use um, at different points throughout tonight. And so uh, we want to get you familiar with these so that when you see the abbreviations, you automatically know what it is. Um, the, uh, the, the main acronyms that we use are uh, MV for market value, WV for wholesale value, ERC for estimated repair cost, HC for holding costs, uh, PF for profit margins, WD, warranty deed, QT, quiet title action, 
uh, your 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 PP is your purchase price, and your OB is your opening bid. So uh, we'll use those at different points, but it's mostly because uh, well, it makes it easier to start using these abbreviations now. So when we're talking about market value, uh, we're talking about the highest value the property can sell for. Um, this is something we'll talk about more when we talk about the duration of strategies here, but this is basically, when you sell for market value, you're selling a clear title with a warranty deed. You can do it through a realtor. Um, if there are improvements that exist, the market value is based on the improvements being in you know, pretty good overall condition. And uh, the other thing to say about market value is that it's often used to determine other types of value like wholesale value. A lot of times those other types of value start at the market value and work their way back. Yeah, I mean, you know, getting a good idea of what a, the market value is in a property that's similar to what you're looking to invest into is going to give you a good idea, just like you said, said Shade, of what wholesale value you will determine in selling it. Yeah, yeah, in fact, um, each one of these, it kind of leads right into this. Wholesale value is actually the next one that we have here. And, uh, you know, when we're talking about wholesale, you know, there's some things to keep in mind here. And I think we have another slide later on, but let's just uh, talk about it for a second now. The property uh, is sold for wholesale value to avoid time and quiet title. Okay, so basically it's to make it go faster and to avoid additional cost of quiet title. Um, titles can be transferred by a quick claim deed, so um, it's, it's something that can be done fast. It means the property is sold as is. So wholesale value generally means the property is just sold as is the same way you know, that you bought it. It's basically a matter of buying something and turning around and selling it. Um, it can be 50% or less of market value. It all depends on what an investor is willing to pay, but that's something to uh, keep in mind. And to remember that you know, they're not going to pay full market value on something. Wholesale value can easily be 50% of market value in a lot of, a lot of conditions. Yeah, I mean, really, it's, if, if we're looking at wholesale properties, we're looking just to turn it as quickly as possible and, and, and reinvest into a new property. And so to do that, there's got to be a profit margin uh, for the investor that's buying it to be able to turn around and make some money to do it. That's really their motivation. They're motivated as well. If we're wholesaling, it's possible we could be wholesaling to a somebody who just wants to buy the property, like a, just a personal person. But a lot of times it's going to be some, to some type of investor. And so in that case, they need to have a meat on the bone. So I think 50% is kind of a good area. You know, it could be anywhere between 40 to maybe 60, 70%, 40 to 60 is kind of that good wholesale value range where anywhere in there, you're flipping a property and there's going to be at least enough meat for some other investor to turn around and sell it and make some money. You know, that's a really good point for people to remember when they're considering something like wholesale value is um, just keeping in mind how the system works here and that when you sell something wholesale, that somebody is still trying to, you know, to buy it to make money. And so if you have your prices up too high to where they can't buy it wholesale and, and be profitable with it, then it's not a deal that's going to work. And so uh, I think that's a good point. That Steve mentioned just to remember how the transaction works when you're pricing it out because you have to leave that profit. You have to remember, you know, the profitability of other parties if you're dealing with other investors. But also, like Steve mentioned, um, the buyer could be an investor or it could just be a local resident. You know, when you list properties for wholesale value, you can get anybody that wants to purchase them. It doesn't have to be an investor, uh, but sometimes it is an investor because they uh, they that's what they do. They buy properties wholesale and they sell a market. Um, and it's a transaction that oftentimes doesn't involve a realtor. And that's because it's a transaction that oftentimes doesn't involve title insurance. But that's uh, something you could, I mean, again, we've talked about other services out there, uh, but that's the main reason why it doesn't normally involve a realtor. Yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of states you can pretty easily, you know, sign over a quick claim deed and sell a property. Uh, in, in some states, depending on your situation, the type of property you may have, an attorney look over it or or help you come up with the right uh, the right contract to sell it but usually it's something that's going to be a pretty easy process as far as transferring your title your interest into the property uh, to the other investor or, or to somebody else and like shade mentioned you know it may be just a local a local person so it may be somebody who lives across the street and knows that you know knows that that's a good value for the property and wants to pick it up or a neighboring property owner or somebody who's looking to 
uh, is is kind of is a, is a personal investment, meaning that they you know they see it as an investment. They're going to go ahead and purchase it uh, for something later on down the line. So it could be a number of different reasons. But when we are dealing re with investors, we need to remember that uh, they're purchasing it to turn around and make a profit as well. And so there needs to be enough for uh, both parties to do that. Yeah. By the way, hey, thank you everybody that's uh, that's joining us here. Um, over the last little bit, we've had different people come in here. I noticed. Um, all of you here just wanted to uh, to say thanks. You're always welcome to uh, to ask questions at any point. If we say something that doesn't make sense, or if uh, if you want us to to address something specifically, okay. ERC estimated repair cost. If you're planning to rehab properties, estimating the repair cost is a skill. Now it's it's a skill you're going to develop, and you're not going to be good at it right away. Um, but again, it's something you learn, just like so many other things. Uh, but you need to actually be able to determine the estimated repair cost in order to set a maximum bid in a lot of cases. So it's an important thing to start figuring out and to get an idea on. Now, um, the estimated repair cost and the opening bid amount, you're basically wondering kind of how they work. Uh, and we'll get into this more in another webinar. But essentially, you can take the estimated repair cost and the opening bid amount along with, let's say, the holding cost on the property, which might be tax and things like that. And if we add all those things up there, we have uh, the total cost of the, uh, you know, basically for the property. If we subtract that from the market value, then what we basically have is our estimated or potential profit margin. Uh, from there, it depends on what we want our maximum bid to be and, uh, and how we start to work the numbers. But uh, that's a starting place for us is to try to figure out opening bid amount plus estimated repair cost will start to uh, add up, you know, the total cost for the investment. Yeah, you know, and one thing to keep in mind when we're looking at anything like the the estimated repair cost or even the holding cost, we always want to be uh, generous with how much we allot for that. We'd rather, would, you know, we'd rather make extra money and had put too much money in there and had extra money left over after repairing than, you know, going into our profit. And so when we're, we're doing that, you're always going to, to err on the side of caution, uh, you know, always add a little bit extra in there. So if there is something unexpected, especially when it comes to tax sell investing, you know, you're not, it's not going to be a surprise. What we're trying to do is we're trying to eliminate any surprises that could cost us money. And that's one thing, you know, and even at the, set, at the three day, we were just uh, raving about land. And that's one advantage to land is it's not going to have a huge uh, repair cost, if any. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely one of the advantages. I mean, uh, if you are buying property with improvements, then um, you know it's uh, it, it's something. Well, really, it's where you also make your money. You know, is uh, is oftentimes with things like rehabs. And so we'll do another webinar. Um, uh, maybe we'll do it next week, uh, talking about uh, talking about rehab work and uh, and estimating repair costs and things like that. Um, AHC acquisition and holding costs. Now, these are the Costs or fees associated with acquiring and holding, uh, you know, a tax deed property. Okay, so uh, some of those types of fees are ones you were all intimately familiar with if you pay property taxes, which generally begin accruing immediately after you acquire the property. Um, other acquisition or holding costs could be things like government liens. Like let's say that uh, that. Uh, there was still a municipal lien against the property for something related to the maintenance of the lawn or something like that. Uh, that would be a cost that you would include in your acquisition and holding cost because you're going to have to pay it. Uh, property taxes, you have to pay. You really can't get around it. HOA and improvement district fees, you kind of have to pay. You can't really get around it. And uh, the same is true of uh, some services like waste management, sewer, things like that. So. Uh, you want to be aware of those costs so that you can account for them. Basically, add them into your overall cost. Uh, that way, you know uh, you are planning on spending them. Yeah, I think that's a good point. You know, even today I had uh, somebody send me an email that was watching one of our faith, uh, one of our YouTube videos, asking that question. You know, essentially, what properties do I have to? What property taxes would I have to pay? And really, you're you're not going to be paying back property taxes. You're going to be paying property taxes since the day you purchased the property. And so if you hold the property for six months, you're going to essentially pay six months worth of property taxes before you sell the property. Yeah. And also, you know, the, uh, the HOA, the improvement districts 
are kind of like HOAs. They are parts. There are parts of the country where the standard property taxes don't really collect enough revenue to pay for a nicer community and to handle a lot of the costs associated with it. And so there are certain improvement districts that have popped up. And basically what the improvement district does is it's kind of like an HOA within a county. Uh, the annual property taxes are still owed, but there's an additional fee that goes to the improvement district, um, which again kind of acts like an HOA. So uh, you want to be aware of whether or not there are improvement district fees or something similar to that or HOA fees in some areas uh, when you go to buy because uh, again it's just you want to be aware of the fees you can't get around. Yeah, something similar to that would be um, a special assessment fee like in Nevada where they'll issue tax liens on special assessments and really what that is that just goes to pay for sidewalks and roads and things like that within the community and they essentially have an additional lien so as you're doing your due diligence a lot of these states may not have something like a special district or special assessment but you're going to want to go through and make sure that all of those bullet points are hit before purchasing one of these tax deed properties. Yeah. Now, your profit margins, I think most people would know uh, or generally would know what your profit margins are. Um, but in this example, to give you an idea, um, if, uh, if you add, again, that, uh, that opening bid amount plus the uh, estimated repair cost minus the, uh, the market value, you're going to get basically your potential profit margins there. Now, from there, um, that's with an opening bid amount. This is all about figuring out what your maximum bid amount would be. And so you've got potential profit there, but then you also have to account for, uh, yeah, basically for what you want your overall profits to be on, on the property and, uh, and what you're willing to pay. Uh, but that's essentially where you'll start to figure out. So again, if you had a, an opening bid of $5,000 and estimated repair costs of about $5,000 on a property, uh, and let's say that it had a market value of about forty thousand. Well, that five thousand in opening bid plus five thousand in, in estimated repair cost would be ten thousand dollars that we would subtract from the market value, uh, which would basically give us for a long-term deal here total possible profit margin of thirty thousand. Now, we would obviously have to figure out uh, from there what. Uh, our maximum bid would be because uh, it's not going to, we're not going to bid it up to market value. So we have to determine how we're going to sell the property from there, which is how uh, our exit strategy can play right into the, uh, the uh, it plays right into the maximum bid for us. We have to kind of know it in order to determine maximum. Yeah. Bid. And so if we were looking at that example you had with the $5,000 opening bid, if we were to just to, to bid that up to 10,000 being our purchase price, uh, with 10000 then essentially, you know, instead of having $30,000 $30, of profit, we'd have $25,000 of profit. And from there, we'd know, you know, exactly what strategy we'd go. If we'd go wholesale, then maybe we turn around and we sell it for... Uh, yeah, 50% of market. Yeah, exactly. Maybe we sell it for $25,000. Uh, or if we're going to go through and get quiet title, then we turn around and we try to get the $40,000, 45000 yeah, and you know, if we decided um, if uh, if we were going to sell it wholesale, which would mean that we figure that our selling price is going to have to be right at about twenty thousand, then if it opens up at five thousand, and we figure um, you know that there's five thousand dollars worth of cost, or whatever that's involved with it, then um, we automatically know what our our profit margin there is already down to ten thousand dollars, and uh, basically we know our maximum bid. Uh, it's got to work there within our profit margin, so we're not going to bid it up a crazy amount because uh, our strategy is to wholesale it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and one thing to take account in as well is when we're looking at wholesaling, are you going to uh, be wholesaling it with fixing the property yourself, or are you going to discount that even a little bit more so that you can wholesale it and have the investor uh, be the one that goes and fix the property up and adds actual, you know, cost, repair cost to it? Is, is that going to be something you do and try to get a, more money for it, or is that something you're going to have the investor do by discounting the price and putting that into the price of the investor so the investor buys it? Yeah, that's a really good question, and it leads right into uh, what we're talking about here first with the, uh, the three general time frames, which uh, also have different objectives, different outcomes here. So if we were to say exit strategies generally fall into three time frames here, 
the way that we break them up is into wholesale flips, short-term strategies, and long-term strategies, okay? So a wholesale flip, um, we could say, is really zero to three months, but really it should be 30 days or less, you know, in reality, because uh, we're not, we, we don't have to wait for anything. There's nothing there that we're waiting for except to line a buyer up, okay? So this is something that can be done quickly using a, 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 a quick claim deed. Um, when we're talking about a short-term strategy, um, you know, I guess let's talk about each one of these briefly, okay? Wholesale property flip, this is uh, a fast flip. Again, this is all about speed. This is all about being able to turn the money over quickly, okay? So a couple things to note about it. Property sold as is, transferred by quick claim deed. Um, yeah, like I said, time frame, 30 days or less. It shouldn't take that much, you know, that much time. We talked about wholesale values. This is gonna be a cash or full payment transaction most likely, unless it's some type of a deal where we're offering seller financing, which is also something we can do with wholesale deals. Yeah, and a lot of times with seller financing, if you do offer something like that, you can actually kind of split the difference between wholesale and market value so that you're giving them a discount, but you're still getting more than wholesale value since you are acting as the bank. Yeah, in fact, yeah. When you can offer seller financing, uh, it's always going to, um, give you the ability to also increase the price a bit. We don't have to gouge people. In fact, I remember um, when I used to work at a, at a car lot. I used to work at a car lot when I was a teenager. And uh, sometimes people would come in and it was interesting working at a car lot and kind of seeing what happened. Because if somebody came in that didn't have good credit, then what that meant was that they were desperate or that they, you know, uh, if we could get them approved on a car, they didn't care what it was. And so what would end up happening is, is uh, car dealerships love these people because they just end up making a ton of money on them. It is shameless, you know, what they do. Uh, but what it always reminded me though, uh, at the time was that uh, when people are, are, when you're offering something like financing on a deal like this, they don't mind paying uh, a higher price. In other words, you might not sell it for complete wholesale, or maybe you jump it from 50% wholesale up to 60% wholesale, or 65% wholesale, or 70 for a little bit higher selling price because you're also financing the property, which is making it possible for them to even buy it. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, okay, short term, when we're talking short term, this is what we're talking about. You buy property with the intent of getting quiet title uh, pursued, completed, and having a warranty deed on the property. In other words, your goal is you're buying it, you're probably going to fix it up a bit to make it as valuable as possible because again, you're gonna be hanging on to it for this time anyway. But your goal here is to be able to sell it for market value, but again, not to hang on to it forever, okay? So you have to hold on to it long enough to get quiet title on the property and to get it sold uh, you know, using more traditional methods, like you could use a realtor uh, in that case. But again, it's uh, it's more about selling it for maximum value, uh, and however, whatever length of time it takes to make that happen. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So you know, you just like you mentioned, you may be going in there and doing rehabs. Uh, you're going to be taking it through the process of quiet title. All of that is going to take expense, but you're doing that because you know the profit is worth it. And so even with the short term, it doesn't have to take a year. It doesn't have to take 12 months. Uh, you could purchase a property and, and, and do the rehab and possibly do the quiet title within three months or four months. And, and at that point, having it at market value. Uh, but any time within there, once you're doing the rehabs and, and going through to clean the title, uh, you know, you're going to be looking at a time frame anywhere between 1 to 12 months. Uh, really for the goal of, of getting the highest price on the property you can. Yeah. Now also, you can have um, different methods of monetizing the uh, the property going at the same time. In other words, you could be renting the property out at the same time so that it's also collecting money, uh, you know, while you pursue uh, a, a quiet title on it. Now, uh, other things are rehab efforts are going to pay off a lot in situations like this. So. Uh, your main goal when you get a property like this is for your money, it's to make it rentable. That is, uh, that is your, your primary objective here is to make it rentable because that's really what you're trying to do. You want to make it livable and, uh, and, and rentable. Um, 
Now, oh, here's a really good question we have from, uh, from uh, one of our members here. Um, greetings, he said, um, I want to know if I purchase a vacant land, uh, if I purchase vacant land, can I get a home equity line of credit on it uh, to get more funds to invest in tax deeds? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, if you buy any of these properties, you own them outright. And therefore, uh, you can basically borrow against uh, your property portfolio. So, um, you know, you, now as far as getting a home equity line of credit on it, I'm not sure if that's the type of credit that it would be, but it would be a type of secured loan, uh, most likely because the, uh, the lender would be using the property that you own in your, uh, your real estate portfolio um, as a basis for the money that they would borrow you. Um, now, uh, really when it comes to, to any type of line of credit, be that a home equity line or even something as simple as credit cards, anything like that can be used in your business. And one thing we were talking about with some of our members at the uh, three day was that there's a lot of different counties that are actually accepting debit and credit cards to purchase tax deed properties. And so if you were to have a credit card, even using a line of credit like that can be used as a, as a way to increase your funding, uh, to increase your buying power. And if you have a low enough interest rate, you know, you could turn around and sell that property within uh, you know, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and be able to pay off any of the funds that you used, and have and have a good, pro you know, have a nice profit in, as, as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. In fact, uh, so just to make sure that uh, that that um, we're answering your question, uh, yes, you can definitely get a line of credit though based on on uh, properties that you hold in a portfolio, which uh, for a lot of people would be worth it alone. Uh, as far as a reason to, uh, to have the property. There's also tax benefits associated with holding on to property. When you buy and sell property, something you have to consider and think about is capital gains. If you know, if you're making a, uh, a, you know, if you're making a good profit every time, then you're going to have to pay taxes on that. Whereas if you keep the property, then you're not paying taxes on that yet. So uh, that's, there's some, a tax benefit there. Also something just to mention here, um, on the uh, the short term period here between one to twelve months, hey, this is when you want to get the property insured. It's time to get the property insured. Uh, if uh, you know when you're holding it for that time period, because the property you pick up picked up for a really good price is about to become worth a lot of money, and you want to uh, to have that uh, insured. So this is a good time to start thinking about um, you know adding it to uh, to some kind of an insurance policy. Now, long-term strategy. Okay, this is basically where you hold on to the property for more than a year. Uh, let's say you don't have an exact plan on when you, you're going to get out of it, but that's because you value the property for the, mon you know, the monetary value it creates every single month. Uh, in other words, you know, you're earning money through the rent or through the lease, you know, or whatever kind of finance you're option. And you can also be earning money through uh, value appreciation that the property will be uh, will be picking up. So you own the property outright as it gains in value. Uh, you know you're making money on it that way, and as you collect rent every month, uh, you know you're also making money on it, which uh, you know is really I think the, uh, the the best way to create some type of a true retirement account. That's the best way to make money that will give you real freedom is to collect and create uh, residual income. Yeah, I think one of the advantages to this as well is you can save, sometimes you can save funds if this is your strategy by not going through quiet title. Uh, you know, some states like, well, every state's going to have a certain time frame or a certain period that they uh, will, that before they will go ahead and issue a warranty deed. But in a state like Florida, that, that time frame is four years. So that means after a four year period of time, let's say that you've been renting or lease optioning or financing the property, you're going to automatically receive a warranty deed or you can apply for a warranty deed depending on the state. So that gives you the ability to, if you're going to be renting it out or making an income property uh, during that time frame, to just wait a little while, get that warranty deed and save yourself the money. Yeah. You know, I think that, uh, that uh, one of the, uh, the, the keys, one of the secrets I think to security is multiple streams of income. Okay. You don't want to rely on one source of income just like you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket on anything. Well, this is especially true of your income sources. 
Uh, the more streams you have of revenue coming in on a regular basis, the safer and more secure you really are financially. Okay. In other words, if you had to stop working tomorrow, uh, would there still be money coming in for you on a regular basis? And that's one of the benefits of long-term real estate and of uh, buying taxi properties like this is that you can keep money coming in even when you're not working anymore. It's basically a system that you'll set up one time and, uh, and it will continue to pay you out again and again and again after that. Um, you know, we mentioned earlier um, about, you know, how you have to know your exit strategy in order to determine your, uh, your maximum bid. Um, also keep in mind that uh, some properties may work better for certain investment, uh, for certain exit strategies than others. In other words, if you find a property that is very close to being rentable, okay, um, a property like that may be ideal uh, to, uh, for like a long-term strategy like this, you could say, because uh, you don't have to put a lot of work or effort into it to start bringing in revenue on it immediately, um, you know, versus if you were to try to do a wholesale deal on a property like that. Well, there's no reason to do a wholesale deal on, on, a, on a property that's almost rentable unless you really need the money. Because uh, if it's nearly rentable, then it's just a matter of time before you can turn that into so much more capital. Yeah, and when you're looking at a property that's rentable like that, it may be worth it to, you know, that's where you need to sit down and decide is it even worth it to go through quiet title so that I get, you know, full title. So that if I just do decide to sell this property, I can sell it for top dollar in a, sh in a shorter period of time. I'm not going to be worrying about trying to get a quiet title. I've already got that finished. I've already got the warranty deed. And now if I decide to sell the property, I can sell it for top dollar. In that kind of scenario, you could get a home equity line or some type of line of credit against the property or even use that collateral. Like Shane mentioned, sometimes you can get real estate portfolios that you can borrow against that collateral uh, to increase your buying power. Yeah, no matter what you do, that property is going to have value. And, uh, and so if a person did nothing but just buy the stuff and just uh, kept up on the property taxes so they didn't lose any of it, uh, they would grow in wealth um, probably more impressively than just about any other investment, I think, in the long term. Yeah. You know, one thing to quickly, quickly add is that when we're talking about exit strategies, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a single family home for you to earn residual income. You know, with the option of seller financing, uh, you, we can seller finance any type of piece of land, uh, you know, really any type of piece of real estate period. And so with, with that strategy, that gives us a lot more flexibility to go out there and to earn residual income off of, off of building lots, off of raw land, off of really any type of, of investment. Uh, because there's people out there that are willing to to invest that way. Yeah. Now, um, we'll see if we can move through some of this stuff pretty quickly here. Selecting your strategy, your exit strategy, uh, the main considerations you're going to, uh, to think about here are first, what are your financial needs? That's going to come first. So in other words, if you need the money, then uh, keeping the property long term isn't really an option. So you have to, you know, you have to acknowledge that uh, need first. Uh, but the second is, you know, what works best for this particular property? That's something to consider as well. And the third is, how does this work with your overall investment objectives? How does this work with what you're trying to accomplish with your goals? And uh, between those three, I think you pretty well select the strategy that's going to work best because there is no right answer every time. It's something that's objective. Yeah, and I think by going through those three questions, that'll give you a pretty good idea of exactly what strategy you want to pursue. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now, when it comes to selling property, there's never been a better time to sell stuff in the world than right now. Uh, there has never been uh, an easier time to reach out and, and to be able to, uh, to get your product in front of so many people for no cost at all. I mean, that's never even been possible until the last 15, 20 years with the internet. The same is true for strategies uh, based around selling land or selling real estate. It's never been easier than it is now. And we've got so many different tools and resources uh, around us and the majority of them are free uh, or cost very little. And so uh, there's no reason to let uh, real estate exit strategies intimidate you or scare you because uh, I promise it's, it's easy to find buyers, especially at the prices you'll be offering stuff at. 
that's the other thing about selling property is is when you have the freedom with your pricing, you can always decide how fast you want to sell it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's what's different between this investment and say buying your own home. When somebody's buying their own home, you know, this is their investment. They've tied up into it. They're trying to get as much as they need to. You know, and, and also they probably paid a lot, they played close to market value in most scenarios for purchasing their, their own home. When we're talking about purchasing these type of properties, we're picking them up for such a for such a percentage of their actual value that that's where that's really what gives us the ability gives us the price yeah I mean when if you pay 15% uh, of you know for a property or 10% for a property uh, then you know you have abilities other investors aren't because that they don't have because you could drop the price by 20% if you wanted and it's not that big of a deal I mean you're only going to make money on this it's just a matter of how fast you sell it but for most people, the idea of dropping the, uh, the price of their real estate by 20% would about kill them because they probably paid closer to full price to it. So again, you're in a, in a real position of power here when it comes to uh, your ability to sell. So we're going to talk about each one of these here um, quickly uh, because I think we've got even more stuff we can cover here after this. Uh, we're going to talk about for sale signs. U.S. mail campaigns, social media websites, auction websites, classified websites, uh, real estate agents, or realtors. So for sale signs are going to be the first one we're going to mention here. And uh, you'll hear us just talk uh, over and over again about for sale signs, but it's because they're highly effective. You need to let the local people in the area know that that property is for sale. And a for sale sign is one of the best ways to do that. And so if you're not local to the area, it's worth it to hire somebody, hire a handyman to go out and to install a uh, for sale sign there. They can take pictures and images, you know, they can do things for you while they're, they're on location as well. Um, but a for sale sign is, uh, is really uh, uh, one of the best ways to let some of the people most likely to buy it, uh, let them know that the property's for sale and what the price is. Yeah, I mean, you, the people that drive driving past every day are the people that live within that area. So usually those are the people that know people that are interested in buying, maybe interested in buying themselves uh, or have family or relatives or, or, or some other connection that may be interested in, in that land as well. So putting a for sale sign is going to let the whole world know that you're, that you're offering the property for sale. In addition to that, you don't have to spend huge amounts of money on a huge expensive sign uh, to be able to do it. You know, there's lots of, of, of different signs that you can use and pick up for, you know, 10 ten dollars fifteen twenty dollars uh, even less to be able to put into that yard where it's not like a, a full wood for sale sign it's just a sale sign letting people know that that property is for sale you know in the past one of the reasons why you hired realtors um, was because they could get you additional exposure you know because they could get you exposure that you couldn't get on your own uh, and really and that was a huge value that they offered at the time, but that's kind of changed. In fact, um, it, I think realtors are in kind of an interesting position right now because there's so many things people can do on their own to sell property. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, the advantage was is they had access to the to the multiple listing service, and now to a degree, all of us have access to the multiple listing service just through the the properties that are available online. That's what makes finding comparable so much easier. Uh, than it would have been even years ago, if you, unless you were a real estate agent. When I first got involved in real estate and became a real estate agent uh, in my early 20s, essentially, you know, that was what we did. We had the we had the access to the to the uh, to the multiple listing service, and so because of it, we could go in there and do a comparative market analysis. Well, now we can review uh, online information and get a lot of that information. So, definitely, for sell signs, going to make a huge deal in selling the property. Um, we've mentioned this one before, but U.S. mail campaigns can also be an effective way to talk to the neighbors. Okay, in other words, you're not going to send out hundreds of, of letters to everybody around, but you might target uh, maybe the, uh, the five or ten neighbors you think are most likely to maybe uh, find that property desirable, or maybe just the neighbors closest uh, in the area and send them out. I mean, it's just a matter of basically uh, getting a, uh, a form letter put together and printing it up 10 times and sending it out to 10 different addresses and it's easy to get the addresses now for uh, for these different parties uh, you know different people in the area just to let them know that you've got the property for sale simple letter doesn't really take a lot of time or cost a lot of money but can be really effective yeah especially if you're offering the property for a discount 
and let's say the property is surrounded by three or four other property owners. In addition, there's you know another you know, five property owners. So you have ten different property owners that could potentially purchase the property. You can go into the county records and pull up the addresses, uh, the billing. Uh, even if they don't live at that address, you can find the home, the owner's address. Let's first let's say it's lots, for example. You can go to the county information and find out, you know, where the homeowner's address is and send it to the actual homeowner, even for something like a lot. Well, if everyone gets that and they can see that it's a discount, you can actually create some competition between buyers if both buyers or if more than one person is interested in the property. Uh, in fact, this is a way that a lot of this is one of the first things we recommend our students, our coaching students that, that we work with do once they've picked up a property is to send out these 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 letters first uh, to see what type of offers they can come in you know they can get in this is a good way to get a property sold within that first 30 days yeah yeah this is like one of those steps and uh, I don't know that you would want to use just any one of any of these in other words it, it would be great to put a sign up in the yard and that might sell the property for you and if you really want to sell it that's not going to be the only thing that you do um, these are most effective when you combine some of these that's how you're going to get the greatest amount of exposure is, uh, is when you combine things. So, uh, you know, you get a, a, a sign up and maybe you contact the neighbors out there and you start to work some of these other things and the property will get enough exposure that, uh, you know, you will begin to talk to you and get offers and, and find a potential buyer. Uh, the social media websites are the same way. In fact, I mean, you and I are not great with social media websites, but social media now, I mean, boy, people, People that are decent about staying on top of that can turn that into such a huge following of people. Yeah, well, e e even just as far as selling real estate, I mean, that's something that we've had to we've had to kind of change our attitude about and and embrace it uh, just to be able to really offer properties. Because one of the things that social media does is it gives us a free platform to uh, put our properties and our investments in front of as many possible people as I mean, just the you know millions of possible people. And so something like Facebook, you can do it on your own personal page. You can create your own real estate page. So, you know, Bob's Real Estate or whatever it wants to, you know, you want it to be. You can create a specific, a specific page, Facebook page, a Twitter site that has that's completely dedicated to your business. And so all of these are going to be good avenues and good ways that you can use to offer the properties to a large number of people. Yeah, in fact, if you're good enough with social media, you probably wouldn't have to work that hard to sell any of your properties uh, because they'll end up selling themselves. Also, something that's worth noting is that uh, if you are buying real estate in a certain area, you need to go on Facebook and some of these other social media websites and find groups that are selling stuff there. There are groups of real estate investors in every part of the country and you can join those groups and it's a great way to be able to offer property to like-minded people that may also be looking for investments or buyers so uh, you know check out those groups when you get into social media look for the specialized groups because um, they're a fantastic way to uh, to get the property in front of people that are interested in buying yeah I think that's a good point for example if you purchased a property in Florida look for a Florida real estate uh, group Facebook group uh, Twitter group, uh, Instagram, anything like that, any of those online services or online social media websites is just going to increase your exposure. Yeah. Now, auction websites are another uh, service that has uh, popped up. I don't know, eBay's been around for 20 years or so, it seems yeah. like. Um, but uh, it's evolved and it's changed, and it's only become easier to use, and they've only it's only grown in audience. And so now, uh, using a service like eBay, you can auction, I mean really, you could just list properties on eBay and probably sell them doing nothing else if that's all you were doing. But again, we want to incorporate several different uh, methods. So uh, auctions are a great way to get a lot of exposure and uh, it doesn't cost you too much. Uh, it seems like they charge around 10% or so to uh, do that. Yeah, so I mean you're going to get charged, but that's going to be if you sell the property. And so that's just an expense that you're essentially building into the price when you list it for sale. The advantage to the auction websites is you can sell them for, for quickly. Uh, you know, of course, the disadvantage is depending how you set the auction is how much you're going to give for the property. Uh, but that can all be really determined by you, so it's not necessarily something that you'll need to worry about uh, selling a property for less than you are willing to take for it. 
because you can either set reserves or start the opening bid amount at that. Uh, this can also be a great way if you need to sell the property quickly. In addition to just selling it, you can use eBay to, to essentially seller financing, uh, to offer seller financing. So what will happen is, is the, the bid amount, uh, the amount that's bid is actually a down payment on the property. So, you know, maybe it's a, you know, the, you start at $100 and the down payment ends up going to 500 Essentially, that's the down payment on the property. And then there are six, six you know, through, through bidding on that down payment, they're essentially agreeing to buy the property at the set price that you have in your auction. So, if, you know, if we were looking at this lot, let's say we had it for sale for four grand, uh, you know, on eBay as a seller financing, that $500 would go to pay the down deposit. And then we would go ahead and set up a, uh, an agreement where they are, we're seller financing it for 4000 over a period of three months, I mean, uh, three years or five years, essentially, where they're paying a monthly payment to essentially get the property. Yeah. So the auction websites are nice. There's also another really good resource um, that is just classified websites. Now, uh, some of you might think like uh, Craigslist when you, uh, when you hear this, and that may be the most common uh, classified in the area that you're at, but that's not going to be true necessarily everywhere. Um, there are lots of classified websites out there, aside from just Craigslist, uh, that are oftentimes um, regional. You know, they might be based, for instance, here in Utah, we've got, uh, we've got KSL, local news station, that also has classifieds on its website. So if we were looking to, uh, to buy something like, for instance, an easy way to kind of figure out uh, the answer to this is if somebody wanted to buy a car in that area, where would they start looking? And, uh, you know, in other words, a used car. And if, uh, if it's Craigslist, then that may be the best service out there. But if they know of another place where they can start to look for things like that, then they have another service. And the classified websites are a great place to post property for sale because, uh, in fact, a lot of them are they're free now. You can also do paid ads, though, if you want. Um, but you can, uh, you can list the, the ad. Uh, and then advertise it and get a lot of exposure, you know, with things like this. It's all about doing the minimal amount of work to get the maximum amount of exposure. Yeah, you know, some of those websites that you can check out are usually going to be the the newspaper, the TV radio stations, uh, the newspapers within the area. Uh, you can also check for any other type of uh, any other type of real estate classified sites. Maybe they have a local real estate classified website. A lot of places will have that. And there's also websites out there like Land Watch and other paid uh, classified sites that are real estate specific. Yes, like Realtor.com. We look yeah. at that one all the time to see what property is listed for sale for. Yeah, absolutely. So there's going to be different services like that that you can go ahead and, and uh, pay to have your property advertised on. That's going to bring it a lot more additional uh, eyes on it because you're using one of these big paid resources. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, um, like I mentioned just a second ago, we use uh, valuation websites whoops, like um, like Realtor.com uh, or Landwatch. Uh, when we are performing due diligence on property to get an idea of uh, what the bottom line for that property might be. In other words, um, you know, if we're about to buy a piece of, of raw land in an area, we don't want to do that until we have some idea of what type of raw land is currently on the market and how much it's selling for. Uh, because we want to be sure of that before we make the purchase. And so we're going to check into that beforehand to make sure and look around to see what's actually listed for sale. And uh, that will help to guide uh, our decisions on, uh, on a lot of things when we can see what, you know, what the real estate market is like in a certain area. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Especially with similar types of pieces of property. So like, uh, it's especially important if we're looking at something like raw land. Yeah. Because uh, we need to find something comparable to, you know, compare to. So we're looking at other raw land that's going to be, show, you know, similar in size, um, you know, to try to get an idea of what's selling and what's not. Yeah, we're going to use that same process for single family homes, anything like that. And it's just really going to be a matter of, of finding those properties and doing a, uh, a comparative market analysis to really determine what that value is. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you have the ability to use um, a, a real estate agent or a realtor, which you can actually do on any kind of real estate transaction if you just have the, uh, the arrangements made, uh, we're 
used to seeing realtors working in deals with warranty deeds most common, uh, most commonly, but uh, they can sell any kind of real estate really as long as you have some kind of arrangements with, uh, with them to make money on. Yeah, I mean, you know, most most of the state laws are going to allow uh, that. You have to talk to the realtor, but most states are going to allow them to sell any type of real estate, even if it's a quick claim deed. Uh, it's just going to be a little bit different uh, type of sell, and so you can ask uh, real estate agents if they're willing to or if they're able to uh, sell property that doesn't have a warranty deed and sell it through quick claim deed. And that could be a great way. Also, of course, if you're going to be going through warranty deed and you want to get top dollar and you don't want to, uh, you're gonna, let's say you're out of state or something like that, a realtor can be a huge asset for you, especially if you pick them up in the beginning. You know, they, they're, they might be able to help you. Uh, if you plan on using a realtor as you, and going through quiet title, you know, even before you purchase, then you're going to want to start finding a realtor then uh, because they could help you find a, a title company or they could help you go through quiet title or they could help you find a cleanup crew or yeah, anything else. A real else. estate attorney. They, they already have all the contacts that you're most likely going to need. So, um, you know, since we're running out of time here, we've talked a little bit about some of the holding strategies for property, you know, things that you can do when you're holding property. I mean, like, for instance, just holding property and, and not losing ownership of it, the value of that property uh, definitely is something that, uh, that has true value you could use to get loans that, um, that uh, basically you can make a part of your, uh, your overall uh, investment portfolio. Now, uh, there are a lot of other things you can do though, uh, rentals, seller financing, lease options, land leases, all sorts of things to create residual income. Yeah, one thing is just going to quickly mention about hold for appreciation. This isn't a strategy that we necessarily recommend, but it is something that uh, that could be profitable. I mean, especially if you're looking at purchasing a property or you've bought some property for low dollar, you know, low dollar deeds, land, homes, anything that you're purchasing for five, ten, fifteen cents on the dollar. Well, the just the uh, the appreciation alone. Let's say it's going up ten percent a year in that in that market the real estate market is, and you're paying 2% for the property taxes, you're already ma automatically making an 8% return just off of a piece of land that you're just doing nothing but sitting on. Yeah. And so each, you know, essentially you're making a, a great return, even if it was only 5% return. By the time you paid your property taxes and the appreciation, you're making, an, you're making a return on your money each year as that property is going up in value. Yeah, what it is is it, it's compound earnings. You know, you're basically earning <clears throat> in more than one way at once, and and uh, and if you really want to uh, to increase your uh, your your ability to make more money, uh, create more systems where you have compound um, earning. You know, where you're able to earn money in more than one way at once, which is a rare opportunity that you get with uh, with long-term real estate. Um, well, let's see here. You know, we pretty well talked about uh, about seller financing, lease options, land leases are also another thing that you can do with uh, with land. Uh, for instance, things like farmland is is uh, is leased out all the time uh, to farmers that want to use it. In fact, a lot of farmers would prefer to lease out their land than to actually own it. It works out better for them uh, that way. Um, you could do the same thing with hunting land, uh, you know, or large plots of land. You could, I mean, it's something as simple as if you had a lot, you could. Uh, you could charge somebody if they wanted to park stuff there, uh, you know, for storage area or a, the possibility yeah, really the is the limit, really when it comes to all your income options. I mean, even if you had a big, let's say you bought, you know, 100, 200 acres out near ranch land or something, you could rent it to ranchers to graze on the property. I mean, there's a, there's a, the, the ability once you've obtained that property, uh, you know, and it has those different types of uses. The ability to lease it for different uses is really unlimited. Yeah. In fact, you know, really, you could start out in the beginning just targeting properties that are adjacent to other property owners and contacting some of the surrounding neighbors and selling those properties for a uh, for a profit. Those deals happen fast. You could probably just focus on just that step alone and build up a pretty good amount of working capital off of just little pieces of like uh, of of adjacent land that would be probably considered to be junk land to most everybody else, but to the people that you'll end up selling it to. So there's a lot of strategies out there um, that you can pursue, even if you didn't necessarily have the capital. Uh, for instance, like adjacent land, you could pursue that strategy without even actually buying it. 
because you're learning this skill. You learn how to find it. You know, you learn how to find it and how to contact the people around it. And um, in fact, with the Jason Lane, you pr you probably want to contact the owner before you buy it because you'd hate to buy it and be stuck with the property you can't sell. So, oh, oh, yeah. in contacting the owner beforehand and, and getting them to agree to buy it, you can essentially buy it and, and essentially already have that contract almost done. It's just a matter of uh, finishing the process on your end. Yeah, it's true. And you know, the flip side of, of that is that um, you wouldn't want to necessarily buy it first before you found out what kind of interest there was in it uh, because, you know, you're basically dealing with the only people in the world that are going to care about the property. And if they don't want it, you're not going to have a hard time selling it to anybody if it's a true uh, piece of adjacent property, you know, like landlocked or, uh, you know, something that has, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, several neighbors may share. Yeah. Well, that's one of the advantages to tax sale investing, I think, over any other type of real estate is that there's so many different selling strategies out there. And because we're purchasing this property for such a discount, that's really where our flexibility comes from. You know, if you're purchasing a property for 95% of its value, then, you know, you're limited to how you can sell it. Essentially, you probably... Uh, most likely, you're going to have to try to sell it with an agent or try to sell it for uh, oh, yeah. well, well, an owner. Not only that, but you have to sell it for full value. You have to hope that it goes up in value because yeah. that's your only bet. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, when we're talking about tax sell investing, we don't have those same type of requirements. We're buying the property for anywhere between 10 to 50 cents on the dollar. I mean, it's crazy. We're spoiled in a lot of ways when we're looking at property for 50 cents on the dollar and we say it's a bad deal. Yeah. You know, anyone else in any other market, even in that same market, if they were to see a property for 50 cents on the dollar, would say that's one of the best deals they've seen all year. You know, we look at that one, and depending on the property value, say, ah, you know, we may not purchase this property. Yeah, it's true. You know, tax foreclosures really are a pretty amazing uh, opportunity in that way. You know, the only way that, that we've ever seen that you can pick up property, uh, cheap numbers like that. So... Anyhow, we, uh, we've covered a ton of stuff here tonight here pretty fast. If we've left you with questions, please uh, contact us and send those questions over to us. We're happy to, uh, to go through them and to, uh, to answer them. And uh, we can cover topics uh, based on what you're interested in if, if you want. You can always uh, email us uh, and let us know if there's something you'd like us to cover or if, uh, if you have specific questions. So, hey, we uh, always appreciate you guys. Uh, it's always good to see you. Thank you so much, Randy. Thank you, really, each one of you guys, uh, all of you. you know, I, I would love to go off and just call off everybody's name here um, you know, for uh, everybody that's attending. We, it really means a lot to us you know, that we, uh, we tend to like to see you here, and uh, we hope you'll let us know if you have questions. Yep, you guys have a great week, and we'll talk to you again next week. All right, we'll see you later.